by this point, we're used to the fact that anytime Venezuela is mentioned anywhere, it tends to be followed by hyperinflation, riots, poverty statistics, and strongman dictators holding on to power. But that's only the tip of the iceberg, and it doesn't do justice to what could have been one of the world's richest nations. The sad story of how Venezuela got to where it is today isn't down to US interventionism, it's not down to geographic factors, and even though the Socialist Party was the one that truly made them a failed state, they were more of a large piece of a big jigsaw puzzle that makes up the wider story. The course of history could have been so different, but the same way that a large house built on a foundation of sand will crumble, as will a state that didn't have the preconditions for success. Venezuela is truly one of the most beautiful countries on earth, with beaches, mountains, green pastures, and rainforests forming amazing scenery all around it. It has fantastic weather all year round, a great cuisine, islands that should be a hotspot for global tourism, and is located at a great point to have access to South America, North America, and the Caribbean. At the same time, inflation rates have hit four to six figures per year, depending on where you read. They've had over seven million people leave the country since 2015, Crime and poverty rates have skyrocketed in the last 10 years. Almost one in five people are malnourished and the availability of basic items in supermarkets is never a given. All of this is going on while being the country with the largest proven petroleum reserves in the world and holding 18% of the world's total reserves within its territory while once having been one of the five richest countries on earth. Venezuela's story is one of a century of economic mismanagement at an unprecedented scale. They are the world's poster child for the resource curse, as well as a case study for the impact of reckless government spending, the lack of diversification on an economy, the consequences of short-term thinking regardless of how much money is coming in, as well as how capital controls can take a currency that was already on a rapid decline and turn it into one of the worst of all time. It's easy to point a finger at the current government since the ruling party have been in power since 1998 for the calamity that the country currently finds itself in. Having said that, Venezuela's political and economic history is one of booms and busts unlike that that any other country in the world has ever known. The United Socialist Party of Venezuela, who are still running the country today, are the symptom and culmination of over a hundred years of mismanagement lack of planning and no real vision for the future, which has ended up leaving the country in its current state. This is the sad story of how Venezuela got to its current predicament and what we can learn from it. The story of Venezuela, as with all of South America, starts with the Reconquista, as the kingdoms of Castile, Leon and Aragon united to kick out the Moors from the Iberian Peninsula and later to form what we know as Spain today. Soon after uniting as a country, the Spanish famously sponsored a journey to India by going west instead of east, which brought about the discovery of the Americas and eventually the colonization and settlement of those lands by different European powers, with Spain at its forefront. The Spanish explorers set up their first colony in what is today the territory of Venezuela in 1502 and went on to occupy the majority of the rest of the continent in the next 300 years as was the case in the majority of the territories in the Americas set up by European powers, these were mostly set up as extractive colonies, where the main priority was to produce and extract goods that could benefit Spain and the expansion of the empire. Venezuela was based on a plantation-style economy like the majority of the rest of South America. The territory that would go on to form the country was never particularly interesting for the colonizers. They had some success with raising livestock there, there was some gold that they could extract, and eventually they became a large exporter of cocoa. But its importance paled in comparison to territories like those of Argentina, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru. The territory was run by a Spanish ruling class that prioritized making themselves rich and extracting as much value as possible, without giving much thought to the development of the country itself. This bit of background is extremely important to understand how the country got to where it is today. And there are a few key takeaways to carry on for the rest of this video. First, the power structure that the country was run by, with power centralized at the top and the entire country functioning to benefit the ruling class, was never changed, and even remains the same to this day. Second, the economy was entirely import dependent and had no real manufacturing capabilities of its own. 
being dependent on importing most things for their day-to-day -day survival. And finally, on top of the power structure being the way that it was, there was also no vision to improve the country to become an attractive place to live, with no real investment made in cities and infrastructures aside from the capital of Caracas where the elites lived. Of course you can't do justice to 300 years of history in a few minutes, but the country continued along this development track in pretty much the same way until the early 1800s. Following Napoleon's invasion of Spain in 1808, one by one, the Spanish colonies in South America began declaring independence, and eventually, Venezuela followed suit. After three attempts at independence and various revolutionary wars, where Simón Bolívar became a hero to most of the countries of South America, the Principality of Gran Colombia was established, consisting of what today are Colombia, Ecuador, Panama, and Venezuela. That lasted as a unified state from 1819 to 1831, at which point all these countries broke away and Venezuela became fully independent for the first time. Much like in the rest of South America, independence brought no real difference to the majority of everyday people's lives. The power structure continued to be the same, with a strong man in charge of the country and a wealthy elite benefiting from exporting resources in what was still a primarily agricultural society. Since its independence, flirtations with democracy have been a consistent theme. The person in charge would rarely be in power for a long period of time, and in many instances, military leaders would step in to lead the country. No functioning democratic institutions were ever properly built, and although they've had periods of democratic rule, to this day the country is ruled by an authoritarian leader grasping onto power despite opposition. The course of history was changed in 1914, where the real story begins with the discovery of the first Venezuelan oil well which would not only change the entire trajectory that the country was in, but also set the precedent for the big booms and busts that they have experienced ever since. The discovery of the first oil well came at a very convenient time, as the world was becoming more and more reliant on oil as fuel, and the First World War was starting to kick off in Europe, the leaders of Venezuela knew that they had struck gold. Soon after it was discovered, Western oil companies started to come in to provide capital and expertise to set up the operation, and things really started to pick up from there. Initially, the deals that were put in place were very beneficial for the foreign companies coming in, and this would continue to be the case for the next few decades. Even then, very quickly, an economy that was originally based on agricultural and cattle exports shifted towards being dependent on oil for its growth, as it started accounting for two-thirds of the government's income as well as 90% of the country's total exports. As more countries started to import Venezuelan oil, the price of their currency, the Bolivar, started to go up, which had several consequences on society. By the 1930s, the price of the Bolivar had risen steadily for years, which made it more expensive to export goods and cheaper to import them. The knock-on effect that this had was that it was great for exporting oil, since it brought them more money and pretty much every country around the world was in need of it but it also meant that exporting any other goods they produced became hard, since the currency wasn't as competitive on the global market. This type of situation is often called the Dutch disease, where the growth of one sector of the economy, in this case oil, ends up causing a negative impact on the other sectors of that economy, as it did in this case for agriculture. On the flip side, it becomes much cheaper to import goods from abroad, which meant that people were importing most things in society. By the start of the Second World War in 1939, oil money had been coming in for over two decades and had been poured into the economy, making Caracas one of the most expensive cities in the world to live in. It was importing things from across the world and it had a growing middle class. It had changed the country's role in the wider world as well as what things look like at home, but the biggest peaks were still yet to come. During and after the Second World War is when the importance of oil as the fuel that ran the modern world became clear for everyone to see, and the producing nations began to recognize their value in the global marketplace. During the war, the Venezuelan state changed their relationship with the foreign oil companies, which led to the creation of the new 50-50 principle, which made the state an equal partner in the oil industry, bringing in 50% of the profits it made. This was the first deal in the world of its kind and most of the other oil producing nations went on to strike similar deals after the war was finished. The 1950s were particularly prosperous, 
Most of the other oil producing countries in the world, outside of the two superpowers of the time, were in the Middle East, which faced multiple episodes of turmoil during this time. With the decolonization of the region bringing in different kinds of governments, Iran nationalizing its oil company in 1951, and the Suez Canal crisis in Egypt in 1956, the demand for Venezuelan oil soared. They were the largest recipients of foreign capital throughout the 1950s, and at the start of that decade, they had the fourth highest GDP per capita in the entire world. At the time, the government heavily subsidized oil and gas for its population, so the citizens had the cheapest oil in the world, but the vast majority of the wealth was kept by the political and oil elites. There were few to no taxes, little regulation, and consumers tended to have a lot of cash to spend on foreign goods. The government began to invest in infrastructure as they looked to develop the nation, building schools, hospitals, and highways across the country. At this point, education was given significant importance, which would go on to be reflected in the country's growing middle class in the decades that followed. With that being said, there was a carefree attitude towards spending, with the perception that this money would continue to last and grow forever. The thing is, the majority of these projects were extremely inefficient, full of waste, and with a lot of corruption and bribery going around. The country's exchange rate was damaging pretty much any industry that wasn't adjacent to petroleum, and the only industries that were doing well at the time were those being run by the state. With that, the majority of people aimed to get a job working with the government, either in oil, construction, or in the state itself. But if you couldn't manage this, there was very little else you could do, and the number of unemployed people was high throughout. By the 1960s, the global landscape had changed, but the biggest news for Venezuela was the formation of OPEC. OPEC completely changed the game, as it was no longer about Western companies setting the price for oil, but instead a cartel of oil producing countries coming together to regulate supply and determine the pricing. The organization of petroleum exporting countries was originally formed with five members, and that had grown to 12 by 1973. Crucially though, Venezuela was at first the only and later part of a very small minority of countries within that that were neither Arab nor Muslim, and this would go on to have significant implications. This became a very important factor during the 1973 Yom Kippur War. The Western countries of Europe and North America sided with Israel, and the Arab countries proceeded to embargo oil sales to the West as a result of that. This meant that not only did the oil prices skyrocket globally, but Venezuela was the country that made the most money from it. The windfall of money coming their way was absolutely gargantuan, and even those at the time recognized that injecting this amount of money into the economy could cause big problems down the line. They were scared that this would result in rampant inflation. So the government set out on increasing wages, spending heavily on infrastructure, and creating jobs in any way possible. Instead of acknowledging that this wasn't going to last forever and saving money for a rainy day down the line through a sovereign wealth fund, like Norway, Qatar, or Saudi Arabia have done since, they poured it all back in the economy in different ways. With the increasing amount of money circulating in the economy and the inflation rate continuing to creep up, it became more beneficial for people to take out loans and spend that money straight away than it was for them to leave it in the bank and leave it there losing value over time. Even still, the middle class in Venezuela at this time continued growing, and it went on to make up 58% of the population, as people's day-to-day -day lives on average were doing better than ever before. More than ever, it was the goal of the average person to become employed by the state, as that was their ticket to stability and comfort. In the mid to late 1970s, the state started to take steps to nationalize the oil industry, taking over facilities and equipments that were still operated by the Western companies. They expected this to mean more profits in the long run, as they would run it themselves through the state-owned company called the PDVSA. At this time, state subsidies were pretty much the only thing that made even some of the largest companies in the country even profitable, and it was almost impossible for small businesses to take off the ground. Inflation was up, but there was still a large middle class in an economy that was hungry for consumption. If the decades up to this point, despite the turbulence and early warning signs, were the highs though, the decades that followed would go on to be some of the lows. The 1980s were when the downfall of the nation really began. The watershed moment came in February of 1983, when Venezuela had their own Black Friday event, known today as Viernes Negro. 
the price of oil collapsed and Venezuela could no longer sustain its import-heavy society, leading the government to declare bankruptcy and putting in place an exchange rate currency control, where they restricted the movement of currency and attempted to peg the value of the Venezuelan Bolivar to a set amount of dollars. That single day, the country's purchasing power had dropped by 75% in a matter of hours, and the Bolivar had been devalued by 100% by the end of the day. Before this, since the 1910s, the currency in Venezuela had been known to be one of the safest and most stable in the region. But since that day, the entire course of the country's economic trajectory has completely changed. No planning had been done for when the price of oil dropped, and that now became very clear. Companies relied on the state, consumers relied on an overvalued currency, most people in jobs were unproductive and tied to the state, and the flow of cash that was once coming in and keeping everyone happy was now just a fraction of what it once was. Everyday products were still all imported as they didn't produce anything of significance, which just meant that the cost of living kept creeping up. By 1988, the price of oil had not only dropped, but gone below the baseline that they were used to. Inflation ran rampant, and people were buying up supplies of things like food in droves, as they knew that money today would be worth more than money tomorrow. Bribes, corruption, and black markets for anything from food to dollars started propping up everywhere in the country. In 1989, the economy contracted by a full 10%, with the percentage of Venezuelans living in poverty increasing by 10 times over the 1980s. Violence and protests against the government had started propping up, which would really become a larger problem in the early 1990s. The government hadn't saved much of their oil wealth and it became apparent for the public to see just how corrupt they had been. At this time, most of Latin America had communist and socialist movements that were opposing the governments in power. A lot of these were inspired by the Cuban revolution that brought Fidel Castro to power. They were mostly persecuted by the governments in charge and were forced to be guerrilla groups fighting limited conflicts against national militaries. Venezuela was no different, with multiple leftist movements being pushed by different groups. The militaries across the continent as a whole tended to be very against these types of groups, but that doesn't mean that everyone within them held the same beliefs. Venezuela was a democracy at the time, but in 1992, people cheered as a rogue paratrooper attempted a socialist military takeover of their democratically elected government. It didn't work, he was kicked out of the military and he was arrested for it. But from that day, Hugo Chavez became a public hero and the national face of anti-corruption. He was freed under the next president, but for the six years after that, Venezuela's troubles went from bad to worse. With their GDP falling dramatically and inflation rates in the country hitting 100% per year for the first time in the late 1990s. With these conditions being right for someone to come in with a strong message against the establishment, Chavez was democratically elected in 1998 on a mandate to fix the wrongs of decades of corruption, ushering in the start of the current regime we see in power today. Today, Chavez is remembered by some for being a charismatic figure who gave great speeches and championed noble ideals. His speech in the UN in 2006, where he went all guns blazing, naming George Bush the devil and calling on nations to stop American imperialism and hegemony, is objectively one of the best ones that the assembly has ever received, and he was by all accounts a very well-spoken and charismatic figure. Having said that, it was largely during the time that his party spent in power, and it's ultimately a legacy that rests on his shoulders, that Venezuela went from a troubled country that was really struggling, to becoming a completely failed state. As we'll soon see, the practices he championed against and the things that he openly criticized were the type of things that he would go on to do while he was in power. Chavez was born poor, and he rose through the ranks in the military as they went on campaigns against leftist guerrilla fighters. During that time, he began to develop leftist sympathies, and even went on to create a secret organization alongside other military officers who believed that Venezuela needed a socialist government. Prior to his election, Chavez campaigned under the slogan of 21st century socialism, promising the riches of the country's oil revenue to its people. Once he was in power, he was given the green light to rewrite the constitution, where he reformed the Congress and stuffed it with his allies. He renamed the country the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela and went on to enact what he termed to be the Bolivarian Revolution. 
The state was granted power to seize land and redistribute it in an attempt to revive their agricultural sector. And he also gave the state a larger role in running the PDVSA, which had run largely independent of the political structure despite being state-owned up to this point. He didn't like how the company was being run by the people in charge and how it didn't bring back as much money to the company's board. So he appointed loyalists onto positions of significance, including those with no experience in the oil industry. Employees started protesting against the government's intrusion in the company, and eventually a coup was staged to remove Chavez from office in April of 2002. He was unseated from power for just 47 hours, but eventually his popular support and backing from the military got him instated back in his seat. Upon his return, he fired almost 20,000 employees, labeling them enemies of the state. Following this, as people feared a complete collapse of the currency, he had to enact price controls similar to what they had done in the 80s. The price controls of the 1980s had already created an unofficial parallel market for exchanging dollars. But this new set of capital controls took things to another level. They were initially put in place to stop inflation and to keep capital from leaving the country following the failed coup. And for that, they worked in the short run. What they also did was expand the black market for dollar trading, which meant that the gap between the official exchange rate and the exchange rate going on in the parallel market were growing wider and wider. Unlike in the 80s though, the booming oil prices returned in the 2000s, as rapidly developing countries like China started to demand giant quantities of commodities and fuel, which led to the influx of cash for many countries in Latin America, including Venezuela. As the money was coming in, Chavez was in his heyday, which was around the time of that speech we mentioned in 2006. It was also around this time that US and Western sanctions against the country started. These have impacted the country and its economy for sure. But as you can see from the period up to this point, the precedent for booms and busts had been set much earlier. Unfortunately for the country, the lessons from the past hadn't been learned. Instead of saving excess money or building up a proper fund for a rainy day down the line, he used all the revenue coming in to finance his socialist plans. He instituted massive social programs, subsidizing food, housing, and jobs for the poor, and building infrastructure around the country. He started nationalizing many of the country's biggest companies within major industries, filling up these companies with loyalists who weren't necessarily competent in their field, but would report back to him well, and imposing more taxes on foreign companies. Imports had become cheap again and the money flowed. For the average Venezuelan, their quality of life had dramatically improved under Chavez, as they had bounced back from the lows of the 80s and 90s to now have plentiful living and cheap gas. Chavez had begun shifting his narrative, claiming that the economic turmoils of the past weren't due to corruption and economic mismanagement like he had said during his electoral campaign, but instead due to evil foreign capitalists who were the true enemies he was fighting against. When you're the one in power orchestrating the corruption and economic mismanagement, surely someone else has to take the blame. He was able to ride the wave of growth during the late 2000s better than most in Latin America, with the country seeming to come back to stability at this time, even as the cracks were showing. Unfortunately, by the time of his death in 2013, Chavez hadn't managed to save any of his country's vast oil wealth coming in the past decade. He had pretty much spent it all building what he termed to be 21st century socialism. He continued to create bloated and inefficient government companies, did not invest in productivity boosting economic policies, and his goal of fixing the agricultural sector ultimately failed. The booming economy of Venezuela under Chavez, or any of their previous leaders for that matter, was never down to the economy itself or the policies that they enacted. It was always just about the current price of oil. As those prices started to come down rapidly in 2014, the country hit its worst period ever. When Chavez died in 2013, as bad as this may sound, it actually came at a very convenient time to save his image within the international community. As oil prices stopped rising in 2008 and completely collapsed in 2014, he wasn't there to oversee the complete catastrophe that he left his country in. As Nicolas Maduro, a loyalist and his successor to the throne, oversaw the following decade of devastation. 
The agricultural reforms Chavez had tried to usher in to revolutionize the sector completely failed, and the country is still unable to produce anywhere near enough food to feed itself, never mind produce basic items which are regularly out of stock in supermarkets. Since then, as we alluded to at the start, inflation has taken on a whole new level, leading world charts for most of the past decade and turning the currency essentially worthless. The capital controls that Chavez had enacted after the 2002 attempted coup kept creating an even bigger gap between the official exchange rate and that of the black market for dollars, which would only exacerbate the inflationary pressures on the currency. The country was reaching steady double-digit inflation rates since 1983, but since 2014 it's become one of the highest in the world, with one of the worst cases of hyperinflation in history starting in 2016 and really peaking in 2019 and 2020. People's perception of money is completely warped, as they've grown used to seeing inflation increases annually at hundreds or even thousands of percentage points, which means that you end up wanting to spend anything you have as soon as possible, since you know that your money will be worth less tomorrow than it is today. The country has seen historical levels of emigration from a nation not at war, with well over 7 million people having left the country since 2015. The type of people leaving the country has also exacerbated the problem, resulting in one of the worst brain drains of all time and leaving a general sense of helplessness for the future. The corrupt and loyalist officials put in charge of running the state oil company took out so much money and completely neglected reinvestment, to the point that the facilities are run down and subpar, leaving the country with the world's largest reserves of petroleum only being its 25th largest producer. And yes, escalating sanctions have left a dire situation even worse. But as most people from Venezuela will tell you, this is a crisis that stems from their leaders and their history. It isn't just a problem that the corrupt socialist government started, but one that has its history in colonial power structures that never evolved or developed, as well as the resource curse that turned the country completely dependent on oil in a way that they weren't able to use to benefit society as a whole. Maduro has also played a role in making these sanctions worse than they were under Chavez, as he continues to cling on to power, shutting down opposition movements and turning any notion of democratic processes into a joke, as he continues to run the nation as his personal fiefdom. More recently in the early 2020s, he started to act on the classic authoritarian playbook of seeking external conflict to defuse the situation at home. Guyana, who discovered vast reserves of petroleum just off its shores in 2015, has a disputed territory with Venezuela that traces back to the time when both countries were colonies and he is looking to revive these to take back land that once belonged to Venezuela and would happen to grant them access to even more oil that is being extracted with more modern equipment. That is a whole other story and it has a deep history to it, which is far beyond the scope of this video. It's a dispute that isn't as unfounded as some will definitely make it out to be over the coming years. But the timing, the implications it may have for not only the two countries involved but for the continent as a whole, doesn't look like it can play out in a way that is going to be particularly beneficial for any of the actors involved. At the start of this video, I wanted to make the statement that the country really didn't have to be this way. But the truth is, the country was structured in a way where it would have never been able to make the best use of its vast resources, much like the rest of South America. As the Spanish and Portuguese overlords left as independence swept through the continent, the only thing that changed were the people in power not the structures of power. Pretty much every nation was structured as an extractive colony that would benefit only those at the top with no care for developing the rest of the country unless it benefited the extraction potential of the economy. Venezuela had no proper plan for what to do with its almost limitless oil wealth. Saudi Arabia and Norway have created two of the richest sovereign wealth funds of all time, which they're able to deploy and make investments around the world or even at home in a way that benefits them, and for their citizens to consider poverty to be almost a foreign concept. Venezuela not only failed to save any money, but also spent it so recklessly and inefficiently. Corruption around oil wealth has been a staple ever since it was first discovered and the highs of the 20th century failed to become the country's reality because of a complete lack of vision for anything beyond keeping the leaders in power and enriching themselves while they were there. 
A situation like this is horrible to see for its sheer human impact today, but its implications for the future aren't great either. The longer this crisis prolongs, the longer the people who emigrated from the country will go without coming home, and the more detached they'll become. This is probably one of the worst brain drains in history, where anyone who had any money, any aspirations of making something of themselves, or anyone with foresight to see the direction in which the country was going, is now living abroad. The country has been left as the personal fiefdom of the few that ruled it with an iron grip, and the ones that are left there are the ones that suffer as a result of it. It truly is a sad story, and it deserves recognition for what it is. I guess the ultimate question becomes if it's fixable, and even then, that isn't entirely clear. I definitely don't have the answers for this, but what I will say is that the same way that the situation the country finds itself in is unprecedented, the solutions to get it back on its feet will also have to be. As someone who personally spent a couple years of my childhood growing up there and only has good things to say about the experience, the people, and the country as a whole, I really hope to be able to go back at some point in my lifetime and know that the country is stable and functioning again. As much as I personally believe that the Socialist Party of Venezuela is run by a bunch of corrupt thugs who have destroyed what could have been an amazing country, the truth is that the governments before it didn't even do that much better. The biggest differences between the current regime and those that came before it is that they preached against the same type of shit that they went on to do, the impact of capital controls took their toll in the long run, and their lust for power and control couldn't be curbed by opposing forces. That meant that loyalty to their party and a willingness to milk state resources was far more likely to get you into high places than merit. And when you stick a bunch of corrupt and incompetent people in a situation that is already a proverbial house of cards, it shouldn't come as a huge surprise when it all crumbles. I hope you enjoyed the breakdown of the story of how Venezuela got to where it is today. It definitely isn't a light one and it's not a particularly happy story, but it's a relevant one for people to understand to know how the country got to its current situation. If you did like it, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel, where we're going to have a lot more deep dives going into the topics of life lessons, the world at large, people within it, and geopolitics moving forward. Leave a comment to let me know what you think, if you think I've missed anything, or anything that you found interesting. I'm particularly interested to hear from the people who have more experience with Venezuela, either being from there, living there in the past, or having some kind of history or family in the country. I'd love to know your take, see if you have anything that you would add, anything that I should have emphasized more, or your general opinion on what got the country to where it is today, and even more than that, if it's a salvageable situation that you think within our lifetimes, we could go back and actually see the country as a stable and functioning state again. We're still just getting started with the channel, and there's a whole lot more to come. I'll see you next time.